everyone. Good afternoon. It's Susan Coffin. I'm here for Attitude Magazine's ADHD Experts Weekly Broadcast. And today we'll be, we're very fortunate to be talking to Dr. Um, Michelle Frank about how women with ADHD can move beyond the classic shame and guilt to learn to accept themselves the way they are, build up courage, and live with intentionality and curiosity. Um, Michelle Frank will be talking about what acceptance really means and how it differs from just being resigned and what it looks like to practice acceptance and shame-free living right now in the here and now. She'll be offering some concrete steps that you can take to move out of shame and into intentional living. She'll be talking about ways you can improve your relationships with yourself, your children, your partner, your friends, and some key questions to ask yourself to begin to live bigger, brighter, and bolder differences and all. So um, I'd like to introduce Michelle to you now. She is a licensed clinical psychologist she specializes in providing diagnostic and treatment services to individuals with ADHD. And she is the co-author, along with her fellow ADHD expert, Sari Solden, of a book that's just published very uh, officially on July 1st, but already in bookstores for women with ADHD called A Radical Guide for Women with ADHD, Embrace Neurodiversity, Live Boldly, and Break Through Barriers. I have to tell you that I love this book. I read it in Gatley's, and I thought it was really groundbreaking. It really, truly is not something you'll have read anyplace else. It tells you why you should accept yourself the way you are. And as such, it doesn't offer tips for changing yourself or ways to set timers. It's all about feeling good about who you are. So I think it's really an important book, and I hope all of you will go out and look for it at Barnes & Noble, at, on Amazon. It's a radical guide for women with ADHD. So, um, you can also contact Michelle Frank at drfrank at sarisolden.com. We'll put that up um, later if you do want to, to talk to her. And um, thank you so much for being here today, Michelle. We're really grateful for your time. Um, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's our pleasure. And I'll, I just want to go through um, how Attitudes broadcasts work for a minute because most of, I'm not sure if many of you have been um, involved in a previous webinar. But da, da, Michelle will present her slides and talk through those. You can listen to those. You can download those now if you wish to. And then she'll take as many questions as we have time for. So let me just point out some elements of the webinar console that you have on your screen. You'll see an ask a question section of the screen. You'll enter your questions there. You may do it as they occur to you. Um, you will we'll formally ask for them you know, when, when we're ready for Q&A, but just Go ahead and just ask your questions there. It's anonymous. No one's going to see your name. Um, so please feel free to ask anything that occurs to you. You can download the slides now by clicking on the download the webinar slide link in the event resources section of your screen. And um, some people like to you know, print those out while they're listening. If you want to learn more about Michelle Frank, click on the tab just above the slides. Here's an important thing. If you have any audio issues, it's probably caused by a slow internet connection. So we recommend using Chrome browser if you have it, and a wired internet connection can make a big difference. Close all the other programs or tabs, maximize bandwidth, and try refreshing the page if you have any trouble. So with that, let me turn it over to Michelle to talk to you about a radical guide for accepting um, ADHD in women. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for taking time out of your day to spend with me. Um, I hope that you know you take whatever you need from this. Uh, I want to say before we begin that I don't believe in a one size fits all approach to working with ADHD. I believe that living well with this condition, just like with any chronic condition, requires um, a process over time of putting together a toolbox um, and support system that works uniquely for you. And so I'm hoping that today you'll get some tools and some awareness that you can maybe spend some time reflecting on later, either journaling, talking to someone about, or just thinking about um, on a walk or something, thinking about how can you apply this this week even, I mean, what does it look like? Because when we're talking about moving into, sh into change, um, we know that for it change to be successful, it has to be small and gradual 
uh, which is one of the hardest things for someone with ADHD to accept. Um, and so as we move into my presentation today, uh, you know, I want you to really, instead of looking at all of it, maybe at the end, if you could just think of one part of what I'm talking about that relates to you and that you can apply in your life. So a lot of, actually all of what I'm talking about today is a snapshot from our new book, A Radical Guide for Women with ADHD. Um, this book originally, our original title, I co-wrote it with Sari Solden, um, my business partner and mentor of many years. And uh, the original title had the word untangling in it because a lot of this book and a lot of the work we do has to do with untangling from shame-based narratives, um, you know, old wounds that keep coming back up into the present around having invisible differences and unlinking your brain-based differences and challenges from your, your character, from your core sense of self. A lot of women with ADHD um, sort of de-self, right? They, they pour so much every day into trying to manage their challenges. And there's this real myth out there, I think, that to live well with ADHD, you have to manage the symptoms perfectly. And boy, can that take a lot of time because guess what? You can't, um, there is no such thing. This is a chronic condition. Uh, but we find that women with ADHD in, you know, the hopes of, of living a satisfying life, you know, th that if they take the route of trying to fix their brain, and fix their symptoms, then maybe they can get some of that, some of that goodness out of life. But too often they wait and they wait and they wait. You know, when I get organized, when I improve my time management, when my productivity changes, then, then I'll start to live, then I'll take that class I want, then I'll feel good about myself. The thing is, that's pretty backwards. It doesn't exactly work that way, that we, when we look at change from a place of self-criticism and shame, we rarely are able to enact the change we want and truly support our brains to the best of our ability. And so our radical approach, it shouldn't be radical really, but somehow it is, um, is that you, in order to live well with ADHD, you have to stop trying to fix yourself. That strategies while necessary, absolutely are not sufficient. Um, and that you are a whole person. And if we're not looking at the whole person, when we're thinking of what is that goal of treatment, what is the goal of intervention for ADHD, if we're only focusing on symptom management, we're missing three quarters of the picture or more, probably more like 90%, right? Um, because who you are is a lot more than ADHD. The thing is, ADHD plays into who you are and who you are interacts with your brain-based challenges to, you know, to, to build your life every day. And so, you know, there's always a question, is it me or is it my ADHD? Well, you know, those things are intertwined. Our brains and bodies are an ecosystem and we can't really fully separate all of that. Um, and so our approach is one that considers the whole person and sort of asks, you know, what if on top of managing symptoms, we looked at uh, treatment goals for ADHD as being, um, as having more depth, being things like, I am able to express and use my voice effectively in relationships and ask for what I want and need. Uh, I am able to pursue some of my dreams and passions and improve my self care and I'm able to do these things even though I still struggle. Uh, so moving more into the yes and space. I wanna talk first about the emotional legacy of ADHD because that's where the whole shame thing lives, right? Um, I always say ADHD is like an iceberg and what we see is only the top. And even that is very minuscule and it's very stereotyped, right? You know, people think of ADHD, they think of what? I know you're saying, I can't hear you, but you're, you're thinking it probably white, hyperactive school aged voice, right? And so if you're not struggling in school, if you're not having behavior problems, you're off the radar. Um, and so 
our society still has a very skewed idea of what ADHD is, which makes it even harder, you know, for us to understand every day um, and communicate what's going on with us because we're not met from a place of true understanding. We're met from a place of um, identifying stereotypes. So you know, ADHD in women is more likely to go under undiagnosed and untreated for a long time. Um, and I found that even when, you know, as awareness spreads, even my younger clients that have been diagnosed earlier in life, um, because they were able to communicate what's under the iceberg or people were able to see what was above it, few of them actually had the experience of someone validating their differences and explaining what the heck it meant for their lives. A lot of it was looked at their academic performance and um, you know, trying to get them some sort of help to, to change their behavior. But then oftentimes they come around a bit later and realize, you know, this doesn't just impact school, like this is deeper than that. And that's what Sarah and I call doing the deep dive. And it's what's underneath the iceberg. It's things like how women with ADHD often stop having friends over because they're afraid of them seeing the mess, literally and figuratively, or uh, some of the social challenges that can come for teen girls, you know, that are exacerbated by ADHD. For instance, if someone is of a, you know, more combined or impulsive type, speaks without thinking, sort of runs their mouth or uh, blurts out things maybe they shouldn't say, and then you have a whole host of social problems happening. It's about not being able to meet some of your goals or achieve some of your dreams if your challenges weren't identified and properly supported. Um, so maybe that's giving up on going you know, to higher education or having a family, being a mom. Women with ADHD are terrified of both of these things because they're so afraid that they won't be able to live up to it and, and actually do it. So those are, that's ADHD life. And that is much more impactful, you know, sort of all of those, that those dominoes, you know, it might start with uh, trouble with organization, but then it leads to not having people over and then it leads to disconnection, right? So it becomes this big domino effect. And so if we're not working on this, you know, then we're missing a, a huge part of, of, uh, your, uh, of your experience. So if you're a woman with ADHD, you've probably experienced a sh fair amount of shame over the years. Um, and I think that comes from years of messaging. We experience shame. It's one of our early emotions. It's, um, you know, we experience as toddlers even. And so we have whole lifetime worth of shame experiences to build on and, and pull from in our memories when we're experiencing again this moment. And so shame can kind of be insidious and creep up from the past and get triggered in the present very easily because it goes back a long time. And shame ultimately is the fear of total disconnection and unworthiness. And this is a universal human experience, but if there's one thing I hear from women with ADHD, it's that they feel like they're too much and they're not enough. Ultimately, they don't feel worthy. They don't feel good enough. And that really can get in the way of being happy, of being content, of pursuing their interests, of self-care, and yes, even of doing the things that support the ADHD. Shame is a huge part of the ADHD experience that we really need to be talking about um, and, and moving through. We move to ADHD also talk a lot about loss, and it's not just lost keys and wallets, though that's certainly a thing. It's lost finances, right? Late fees, parking tickets, speeding tickets, um, doctor's costs, therapist costs, health insurance, right? Uh, lost goals, uh, maybe lost dreams, a lot of what could have been if I had known earlier. Uh, I hear that a lot. Lost friendships lost relationships, ADHD comes with a lot of loss. It's, um, and it requires uh, some grieving, some act of grieving. Uh, 
of these these relationships and of these dreams and these fantasies of what life would be like if ADHD weren't a thing. Self-doubt is probably one of the biggest saboteurs of ADHD success, and you probably know it very intimately. Uh, it really, um, it's very, it's very insidious, and I think it comes from a history of struggling to follow through, struggling to meet commitments, struggling to live up to what other people tell us is our potential and what we know to be our potential. And so when we are faced with the task, we start really doubting our ability to do it. And we develop a story of I can't. And that story of I can't becomes I can't. It becomes self-sabotage. You've probably heard more and more about rejection sensitivity dysphoria. It's, you know, making some waves in the ADHD community and on social media and in articles and so forth. It's important to know about. Uh, rejection sensitivity dysphoria comes from a history of real and perceived rejection. Girls with ADHD are more likely to struggle, struggle socially, um, and people with ADHD in general are more likely to encounter judgment and stigma about their differences. And those sorts of things, I think, can really... Uh, can really dampen your your sense of confidence about being worthy of being in relationship. And so prior experiences of rejection or being kicked out of the social group or simply being judged or laughed at, for someone with ADHD build up over the years to the point of as an adult, anticipating rejection even when it's not there. So that might mean your spouse says something and you become overly defensive because you, you sense something bad, some sort of rejection. You know, your friends are laughing at something and you assume it's about you. Your boss calls and wants to talk to you and you assume you're fired, right? And so we're finding a correlation with rejection sensitivity and the ADHD experience. And it, it makes sense. Why? Learned helplessness, another um, key component of of the legacy of ADHD, emotionally speaking, but also of self-limitation. And so learned helplessness is when we've tried and tried in the past and we haven't been able to be successful or meet the uh, expectation we have in our mind, whether that's fair or not. And so over time, we begin to feel like we can't, that you know, the, we can't, the I can't story again. Um, takes over. And so we, we stop trying over time. Women with ADHD are more likely to struggle with depression and anxiety for a myriad of reasons. And perfectionism. How often do you, as a woman with ADHD, find yourself performing, putting on a mask, wearing the facade, and having very high expectations of yourself? Russ Ramsey did some research on this. This is one of the most common um, distorted thinking habits of people with ADHD, actually. Uh, sometimes it's about waiting for everything to be right before you can begin because you don't trust that your brain's going to show up and, and do the thing and activate and follow through. And I think a lot of times too, it's about our fear of not being good enough, our fear of being judged, shamed, uh, and ultimately not meeting up to our own expectations. I've also found that people with ADHD tend to idealize what typical functioning looks like uh, and tend to have a distorted lens of what is average or normal. Um, and they see themselves through a lens of deficiency and they look at everyone else around them as being highly successful. And so there's a distortion in that comparison that I think can also lead to the expectations of people with ADHD of their own performance being unnecessarily high. And women with ADHD, like most women in our society, have struggled with voice, struggled to assert needs, struggled to say no, to set boundaries, and to say, help me. And that has to do with the lived experience of ADHD. It has to do with the brain-based experience of ADHD, struggling literally with expressive uh, with verbal expression, word finding, and so forth. Uh, 
as well as just the gender roles and rules that say, be nice, don't make waves. And for someone with ADHD in a position where they need to ask for help, they often tell me things like, you know, I feel like I'm already a burden to my partner, to my co my coworker, my supervisor. So I don't want to ask again. I don't want to ask for more help. So I already feel like a burden. And so their voices and their needs become smaller and smaller and smaller over time. And all of this is a huge setup for having an ADHD life that is totally zoned in on trying to fix the symptoms, manage the symptoms every day, but that totally neglects all of the things that bring in good stimulation and bring in connection. I'm gonna talk more about the connection piece in a minute. I love this quote by Janine Roth. I've tried versions of not fixing myself before, but always with the secret hope that not fixing myself would fix me. You know, I. I think this is a really hard part of living with a chronic condition is trying to find the fix and then recognizing, at least in your mind, that you need to surrender. You need to surrender to the, the reality that this is chronic, that there is no fix. The secret is there is no big secret, right? Uh, and yet it's also okay to struggle with this this idea, this concept over time. It's it's okay to have periods where you wish you could fix this. You wish ADHD would just go away. That's okay. That's, that's honestly part of it. It's moving, however, more and more into a space of reminding yourself that people don't need fixing, perhaps more support in functioning, right? But not a fix. Uh, and, and gaining some self-compassion uh, in terms of how you begin to approach managing your challenges. I'm going to talk a bit about the shame spiral. And for people with ADHD, this is very uh, common experience that you're probably very familiar with. Um, and it's also one that can totally derail a day, an entire week, an entire experience. Um, you know, Brene Brown found that women's experiences of shame tend to be related to looks and to motherhood. Uh, you know, I would add that with ADHD, there's also something that Sari and I call brain shame. And so you've got looks, you've got motherhood. And you've got how you work and think in the world. So for someone with ADHD who maybe uh, lost uh, an important bill or their kid's permission slip or a report for work in their messy desk, or perhaps a coworker commented on the desk, you know, for someone with, the, with these chronic organizational challenges, the my desk is messy can quickly, quickly spiral down into I am messy, right? So notice we went from the desk is to I am. And when we make I am declarative statements, they're very powerful in terms of, uh, in terms of our belief system. So we really need to be careful about what we put after the two words I am. When we say I am messy, I am bad, we're triggering a downward spiral. How many times has that happened to you? And then you've started to think other thoughts like, I'm not good enough. Why can't I just get this right? I'm such an idiot, right? And it spirals down. And so what's happening there is we're having all of these thoughts that are shame-based and they're saying, screaming, you're not good enough. You're not okay. And then we get a flood of emotions and our emotional brain kicks into gear and it gets very protective of us. And ADHDers are master protectors and defenders, right? Because we have this lifetime of experiences um, that have felt emotionally unsafe or invalidating, dismissive, or critical. So our emotions start to amp up and they come from a place of basically fight or flight, right? Our emotional brain says protect. And so then we react to that situation. Something is small as I can't find the permission slip. We react as if it's a huge, real threat 
to our entire being, to our worth, to our value, to our ability to be in relationship. What will the other moms think? You know, my, you know, my sister-in-law can do this, right? Why can't I? The other moms do this, why can't I? Maybe we go into catastrophic thinking. He's not gonna be able to go on the trip now, right? And so we keep derailing. And as we do that, we amp up our emotional brain. And the ADHD brain already struggles with emotional regulation. Um, it doesn't put, put on the brakes quite like it should. Um, and so we're, we're more likely to be emotionally sensitive and reactive. But in this case, when we have a shame trigger happen and we have the thoughts and then we have the feelings, then typically we engage in some sort of coping behavior. And if we're not intentional, it tends to be something that's self-limiting or self-sabotaging. Uh, a lot of self-defeating behaviors, um, things like uh, shying away from um, trying something new again because it didn't go well the first time. Uh, connecting with other people who get it. We start to hide away. We start to pretend we have it all together. I can't tell you how many times women have told me they stay at work late and they're good friends with the cleaning crew because that's, well, one, sometimes it's because they do good work in the quiet, but it's also when they clean up everything and they try to make it look like basically they don't have ADHD, right? Uh, and they feel the pressure to do that. But what happens when you're spending an extra two hours trying to perfect your paperwork every night? You know, burnout. Um, and so the spiral isn't just about a momentary emotion. It's actually, you know, this huge cascade of thoughts, feelings, behaviors that then get in the way of dealing with the ADHD and creating the sorts of experiences that can move us through this. Before we get into how to do this differently, I want to talk about these behaviors a little bit. I want you to see if you can recognize yourself in any of them. Hiding is probably the most famous coping skill I know of women with ADHD. They hide. And it's not just physical, although certainly they isolate and can kind of recluse and pare back activities because ADHD life is overwhelming, because they're afraid to take new risks and take that improv class, for instance, so they stay home. So they, they really do isolate, but they also hide by being inauthentic. They hide by pushing people away. They hide by um, lying, you know, telling white lies or not sharing the full truth, keeping secrets. They hide by pretending. And it's pretty exhausting to pretend every day, right? And so life with ADHD is hard enough. And then when we add this um, compulsion to hide, to essentially show up in the world as if we don't have ADHD, when we do, it makes our, the work of supporting our brain-based challenges even harder. It feels pretty impossible. Um, and I think a lot of women with ADHD struggle a bit with even identity because what's me, what's ADHD? And I put on this mask for you know my family, for other moms, for my partner, for my colleagues at work, and I'm hiding all the time, so who am I? And so that's uh, another deep dive. I think women with ADHD often find themselves doing, typically like a little later in life. A lot of other avoidant behaviors. You know, when we feel shamed, we might pull back and we try to self-soothe or, um, not soothe, not deal at all with our emotions. Maybe that looks like Netflix binging. Maybe that looks like overeating, uh, drinking, um, you know, canceling plans with a friend who's actually really supportive and maybe you'd have a good time with, right? Things like that. We start to avoid, we start to not deal even with our feelings. Learned helplessness, right? That uh, I failed before. I'm not going to be able to do it again, leads to I can't. And that I can't becomes I don't, right? So I'm sitting here, I'm struggling. I haven't been able to you know, perform well um, doing a, you know, this report. I struggle with it. I'm not good at it. It's hard every time. And so then I'm sitting here, I'm writing the report, and the thoughts of I can't are coming up. 
there's a huge likelihood that I'm going to put that off and procrastinate for the ver to the very last minute. And then guess what? It might not be as good as it could have been if we had started even just a day earlier. So the I can't, the way we think about it becomes I don't and then fuels the problem in the first place. Rejection sensitivity leads to I won't risk it. I won't risk connection. Um, you know, I heard, you know, my friends laughing and I suddenly said I needed to leave and left the party. I heard that the other day, um, as opposed to staying and re-engaging, they, there was no evidence in that situation that the group had been laughing at anything this person had done or didn't do. Right. But it, in that moment, it was already a, kind of a shame spiral day. So hearing the friends laughing as you walk back to the table and the get quiet immediately triggered a huge shame spiral. So all of a sudden, you know, she, she left. Whereas there could have been an opportunity there maybe to talk to these folks who were really a group of supportive friends. So we don't risk connection. We don't take the emotional risks to be vulnerable. But what we know is that the antidote to shame is connection, right? And so when the shame spirals lead us to these, this pattern of behavior that disconnects us from the people we love the most and the people that probably want to help us, right? We decrease the, our opportunities to have these shame stories uh, rewritten. We reduce the opportunity for what I call corrective experiences. You know, years ago when I was doing my own work and I was in therapy, I remember sitting there on the couch and like just saying, but how? I know I have the awareness, I get it, but how, right? And I, ADHD is really not about knowing, right? It's about regulating, it's about the doing. And so I wanted to address the but how, because I think all the awareness in the world is, is it's important and it's great, but without action, it's really just a thought. So if we look at what we know about change, right? There's an equation and it does start with awareness because you can't change something you don't know exists or that you're not aware of or you're not present to in the moment, right? But you also have to move through a period of acceptance. You have to greet your reality on its own terms and say, yes, this is what I'm dealing with. This is what the situation is in order to then move into action, right? I think it was Maya Angelou who said, when you know better, you do better. But, you know, if you move straight into knowing better to do better, I feel like there's some shame in the middle there. Um, and that other step is accepting that things can be better, that they're not better right now, and that you can't change that. You can't change the past. You can't change and control every single aspect of this situation. You can't get rid of ADHD, for instance, right? However, you can move into change from a place of value guided action, knowing what's most important to you as a person and what you most need in order to thrive. So it starts really with awareness. And, you know, as psychologists, we get a bad rap for like, you know, always t talking about things and, uh, you know, related to your past and trying to increase introspection. But the truth is, we talk about the past so that we can help you navigate similar situations in the present. Because oftentimes our past uh, has created some automatic reactions that show up in our present relationships and our primary relationships now. And so we look back to uncover that history so that we can recognize when it's happening in the here and now and then help you move into a new choice. So you're not acting from the past, right? You're not bringing the past into the present. And if you wanna stop bringing the past into the present, you do have to do some digging. Gotta take a look back and say, where did I learn that having ADHD differences is bad? Who reinforced that for me? What did I learn about speaking up, about asking for help? What did I learn about how I deal with emotions? What did I learn about sharing what's going well and my successes? A lot of women learned to hide all of these things. So 
taking a look at your shame history is a really important step in doing the untangling work. There are a few different types of messages we receive. Um, there's you messages, right? Like you're irresponsible, you're lazy, why, what's wrong with you, you're so weird. There are, you know, he or she messages, right? Where you hear people talking about someone else who has some similar challenges, you know? Like, gosh, have you seen their office? I can't believe she's so messy. How does she even, you know, how is she so successful, right? Or like, how she, she never is on time, right? Those sorts of like judgy statements we overhear about other people. And then we have a lot of messages absorbed from institutions and the media around us. And, you know, I think we're still working through that in terms of um, what the gender role expectations are and how that's shifting over time, our understanding of the gendered experience. But there still are a heck of a lot of messages that women should uh, be nice, that um, they should, uh, you know, uh, be successful at home. They should be you know, successful as a mother, they should still manage the household chores, uh, that they should look, talk, and act a certain way. And when you have ADHD, even if you wanted to meet all of those gender expectations, you really can't. Your executive functioning challenges get in the way. You know, large um, percentage of household work still falls on women. Um, and a lot of those family management tasks still fall on women. And yet, executive functioning challenges really don't match up with that very well, right? And so looking at like, where did I get some of these messages about who I'm supposed to be as a human being, but also as a woman? What messages did I get about being good enough and what gender roles and rules are impacting my life? And how can I sort of start to break some of those chains? But first you have to really do the dig and then you move into a bit of a harder part. I love Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey, right? And so he talks about uh, the that we need to sort of go through the dark place to come out on the other side, that we all have a journey. That we're all the heroes of our own lives. And I love this quote, we must let go of the life we have planned so as to accept the one waiting for us. You didn't plan to have ADHD. And I'm pretty sure you've tried a lot of different ways to not have it or not seem like you have it, but you do. And it's probably not going away. So how do you work with it? You move into acceptance. Acceptance is the willingness to experience a reality as it is. It's not um, resignation. It's not relinquishing control. It's not carelessness. It's not giving up and say, hey, I don't need to do this work. I don't need to deal with it. You deal with the consequences. It's not that, right? It's just respecting a reality as it is and saying, hey, this is true for me. The more we try to fix ourselves and the more we battle with what's true for us, the more we try to fit ourselves into boxes not meant for us, the less successful we are, the worse the problem becomes. So. I came up with this acronym and it really, <laughs> it only kind of works, right? Nachos. Um, and I'm gonna go through each one now. So the first is notice triggers, right? Notice your shame, shame triggers. This comes from the discovering uh, activity a few slides back. Anticipate them as possible. You know, what, when, where, why? And practice coping ahead. By coping ahead, I mean imagining in, in your mind what it would like look like to deal with that situation really, really well. And then prepare yourself to do that. You know, if you're entering um, a meeting at work the next day, right? If you're uh, going to a, a PTO meeting, PTA meeting, are these scenarios that might trigger easily some shame spirals? If so, imagine yourself coping really well with them. What does that look like? And in big letters, I wrote, slow it down. So when you're in the moment, you're having a shame spiral start, slow down. The next thing you could do is label it. There's a lot of research on labeling emotions. When we identify the emotion and we call it what it is, when we give it a name, we actually reduce its intensity and improve our coping. 
So also just be curious. We want to begin to help you detach from the trigger, from the initial uh, shame wound, from the story of I'm not good enough. And we begin by to create that distance by becoming the observer. Sari and I talk about an authenticity scan, but this is really just mindfulness. It's having a mindful moment. When we're mindful, we're able to blend or integrate our reason mind and our emotion mind, right? Use the best of both worlds. So we want you to observe your internal thoughts and experiences, what's going on, and just pause. Do you feel present? Do you feel authentic? Are you feeling small? Are you feeling, you know, a very familiar pull of an old story of not being good enough or not being able to ask for help? Notice what's going on. The ADHD brain likes to run through things really quickly. And so this is actually pretty hard. It requires the pause. So noticing what's going on. Shame. I'm having a shame spiral. Pause and do a scan. What else is happening? What am I thinking? What am I feeling? Am I being who I want to be in this moment? And then you've got to create the space to cope with the feelings. Again, this is hard for an ADHD brain. It doesn't happen as seamlessly. There, we're prone to what's called amygdala overload, you know, where the emotional brain really takes over. And so we have to start with taking care of ourselves before we can make new decisions or choices within a situation. So oftentimes this looks like, hmm, I'm not feeling very authentic. I'm feeling a shame spiral. I'm having the thought that I'm not good enough. Take, take a break, you know, go for a walk, take some time, tell whoever you're talking to that, you know, you'll catch up later. Even just take a bathroom break, create some space so you can spend some time dealing actively with your emotion mind. When flooded, seek higher ground. You literally cannot apply reason and make balanced choices when you're emotionally flooded. It's the resources in your brain and body are all piled into emotion. And so your frontal lobe, where your executive functioning lies, where your decision-making lies, is not, is not getting what it needs, not getting the fuel it me needs to help out. So you literally need to create time and space and then go through some motions of coping. I work a lot with my clients on distress tolerance and moderating emotion. So using your five senses, take a step outside, you know, label uh, the items around you. You know, I see a park bench, a tree, list five things. See if you can hear every single sound. Notice what you can hear, children playing, cars, you know, leaves. Use, use your senses to get in the moment. Uh, another thing would be to list five, you know, five things. One thing you see, smell, hear, uh, feel, and taste, you know, if you have maybe a cup of tea or something, you know, and to be mindful. So use your senses to ground. This is based in research. This is about moving out of emotional flooding. This is taking care of your emotional brain when you're in the middle of a shame spiral so that you can act differently in a minute. Then you choose intentional action. We want to move you from reacting to responding, but we don't want you to just respond based on what you think should happen or what other people think. We want you to respond from a place of intentionality, from your own values. When we're doing things for other people, we're really just appeasing. And then we're not dealing with our shame. We're not dealing with our authenticity very well, right? So in any given situation, let's say your spouse said something that triggered a shame spiral and you take your break, you know, you notice what's going on, you take your break. How do you want to respond? With that person, you might feel comfortable stepping into a bit more vulnerability than you would if it's someone you just met, you know, a new, a new coworker who said something or did something that triggered a shame response. Decide how much of myself do I want to reveal? Sometimes the answer is you don't. Sometimes the answer is retreat. That's okay too. But we often have an opportunity to deal with things a little bit differently by leaning in rather than running away. Maybe asking yourself, what would my old response pattern be? And what do I want the new one to be, right? What do I need right now in order to do that? And what am I willing to do differently in this moment? 
Maybe you don't want to um, have the hard conversation. You want to avoid, you know, calling that friend back and put them off for three weeks because of the anxiety it produces to have the conversation, right? But is that moving you to higher ground, truly? Is that moving you closer to a more shame resilience? Is that moving you closer to connection? You know, or is it further isolating you? When we know that when you're isolated and you're more likely to get depressed and your ADHD is gonna suffer, right? So if we're not healing our relationships and we're not doing this work in the here and now within our relationships, it does cascade to impact our ADHD. And so that's why Sarah and I often talk about how this is all connected. It's about ADHD, but it's also about living an intentional life. And then speak up. So as I said before, women with ADHD struggle a lot with voice. Um, and now that I think in our society where we have more room for women's voices, we're still trying to navigate how to use them. So state your boundaries, speak up, say it directly. Maybe ask yourself, how, how do you ask for help? Do you ask for help when you have an ADHD moment? Do you become passive aggressive when you're frustrated and feel shame? How do you deal with hard conversations? I recommend um, speaking directly. I recommend moving away from, I'm sorry. You know, like Sarah and I always say, what's next? Like, sorry, I exist, right? Women tend to over apologize. Um, I once bumped into a table and I think I, I said, I'm sorry to the table, right? I mean, it's just programmed. But in order to become more confident and more self-assured, we have to stop apologizing for every little thing and stop taking responsibility for every single thing that goes wrong in the world. It also means moving away from disqualifying statements like the word just, right? Well, I'd just like to add, I'd like to add, Practicing these small changes in how you communicate uh, leads to a feeling of greater empowerment. And it also helps interpersonal situations move along in a way that, again, is more intentional and less reactive. And share your story with others. You, As a woman with ADHD, being part of a community of people who get it is really, really important. It's incredibly healing, and I'd say it's like one of the pillars of, of proper ADHD treatment is some peer support and validation. For instance, there's a conference, it's in Philly this year, uh, in November, you know, there's local groups, ADA, ADD.org has online uh, virtual support programs as well. Um, Chad has a lot of local meetups. Find those and share your story. You know, again, if we're going back to Brene Brown's work, her research shows us that the antidote to shame is connection. And yet when we feel shame, what are we likely to do? We're likely to push away. We're likely to shut down our voice and move away from connection. And so in order to make a shift there, we have to practice the opposite, directly saying what we need, not over apologizing, owning our story and sharing it with others. Um, and on the topic of speaking, I wanted to just put this slide up here to remind you. I think it's incredibly helpful to be reminded of this, that it's okay to set boundaries. It is okay to say no, and it is okay to say yes. Women with ADHD often pare back their lives and they start saying no to opportunities. They keep their relationships maybe on the periphery and don't go deeper and say yes to the invitation to hang out with someone new because they're afraid of being seen. They're afraid of everything that comes with that. But remember, you're allowed to say both no and yes, right? You're allowed to do more than focus only on shoring up your challenges. And when you do ask for what you need, when you do set a boundary, when you do ask for help, it's okay if the other person gives you a change back message. They might, because they might not like it. And that might make you feel a little more vulnerable to going back to hiding, but guess what? That's when it's really important to stay the course because healthy relationships can withstand boundaries and they appreciate differences. So I wanted to throw that slide in there because I find that these are things that um, 
women in general tend to just appreciate having repeated, right? Because we're not told this. We're not, you know, when we grow up, we're not giving these messages. We're giving the message to make everything okay all the time. Well, how do we take care of our, our brain-based differences when we're always trying to take care of everyone else's feelings? It's pretty hard to do. Also, it's okay to cry in the car at the grocery store. I talk to so many moms and women with ADHD who tell me they do this and they feel badly for it, but it's okay to have bad days. It's okay to have days where ADHD does take over because that's life. Uh, and again, that's where sharing your story and connecting with other people can be so validating because you start to see it's not just me. And the next step in this whole process is building a relationship with yourself. You know, it's been said that when women have a relationship with something, they take care of it. And it's the best way to have better relationships with other people and to be in better relationship with your goals and your dreams is to start with having a better relationship with yourself, to treat yourself with compassion, to decide what you wanna to be today, what do you wanna be about today, to take that next step out of your comfort zone, right? And to take some risks for growth, but that has to come from the place of self-compassion rather than self-criticism because we can't shame and hate ourselves into loving ourselves, right? We can't hate or ADHD and shame ourselves for having it and then expect ourselves to deal with it well. So developing that core relationship with yourself, one where you prioritize things other than spending all day trying to fix ADHD, things like you prioritize meeting new people, making some new friends, you prioritize taking a new class or finding a way to integrate your hobby, you take time for self-care, you start you know, modeling for other people around you, what it looks like to take good care of yourself, then you're in relationship with yourself. And when you're in relationship with yourself, it's a lot easier to deal with all of these other things around you, including your chronic conditions. So that's all I have as far as the presentation today. I'd like to move into Q&A here for our last few minutes. Great, Michelle, thank you. Um, I just wanna speak on behalf of everyone who's listening in and saying, posting that they feel so understood and they are, yeah. they are so grateful for just for your presentation and, and also the pace at which you gave it, which they all found to be extremely helpful. So um, lots of questions, uh, unfortunately, yeah. relatively little time. Um, but let's start with the question of how we talk to others about ADHD. Um, Mm -hmm. One uh, one of the listeners asks, how do you decide when and how to tell people about ADHD? I want to combat the stigma by talking about it, but I also am really afraid of being stigmatized or pathologized. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, I think it's, it's important to decide who deserves to know that about you uh, and who deserves to know your story um, and who you really want to know you. I think it's important to like recognize we have relationships all in different levels and that's okay. You know, um, but you have to really decide your level of emotional safety and emotional comfort before you jump into disclosure. Unfortunately in the workplace, it can still be a detriment, uh, though it shouldn't, it, it is, you know, so we recommend saying things like I struggle with, um, this, or I do better when, you know, I I can use the conference room for a few hours a day, so I'm not in the cube, rather than I have ADHD, simply because at, in the workplace, it unfortunately can backfire. In your personal relationships, I think you, you have to be fluid there, and you have to decide who's who's shown themselves, like, open to this, that, you know, open to learning, and also, you know, who values you in a way that they deserve to know some of your deepest, you know, um, experiences. And for some people that's, you know, they're very open and they actually find like the more they talk about it with other people, you know, they, they feel good about that and they feel like they're educating people, but that they're typically at a point where the shame spirals don't happen so easily. Um, if you're still in a place where shame spirals are really regular, I, I'd be a little more careful about choosing those people in those moments. Okay. Um, 
Um, interesting question about um, clarifying your values. You made the point mm -hmm. that with, with it's really important to have value guided actions. Mm -hmm. um, do you have, and, and being authentic. So I think listeners are looking for some thoughts that you might have about helping them clarify their values and determining what is being authentic for them. Um, you know, I, in my dissertation, I looked at like women's concept of self. And a lot of times they said that they felt most authentic when they were alone. Mm. I think though that the truth is we feel authentic in different ways in different environments and around different people. Um, so again, it's, it's reading the situation and it's reading the relationship, determining the level of emotional safety and how much of yourself you want to reveal versus how much you do want to keep to yourself. Um, but so being authentic, I think is more that like, that's why we, we recommend doing the scan, like pausing, really scanning and saying, okay, what, where am I at? Like, do I feel like I'm being real? How much of a mask am I wearing? And how much of that is appropriate here? Uh, am I willing and able to take it off? But the question about values is a little bit different. And I think um, I recommend um, what is it, the VAA strength survey. It, um, it's like VAA just, if you just Google VIA strength survey, you'll find it. And it's uh, a free um, survey that rates like your, your character strengths. And I think that's a good place to find out, like get more information on what your values are, but what matters to you? Like, what do you want to be about at the end of the day? A lot of people with ADHD value um, experience, like novel experiences, right? Uh, they often value, um, like connection and understanding and empathy. They often value um, like curiosity, knowledge, information seeking, um, but that's unique to every person. Every person has a different set of values. So you have to ask yourself, what is most important to me in my life? What do I want to be about? Um, you know, when I say yes to this sort of activity, how do I feel versus when I say no? Uh, when I, um, set this boundary, I felt good versus bad. You know, when I didn't speak up in the situation, I felt good versus bad. It's, I think you have to do some introspection around those sorts of experiences okay. to get in touch with your values. Yeah. That's yeah, interesting. Um, so um, dealing with criticism, mm -hmm. do you have any, I mean, I think rejection sensitivity is just universal among many of women with ADHD mm -hmm. and many people with ADHD. Any, any um, specific thoughts on coping with, with that extreme sensitivity and fear of rejection? Uh, specifically, um, I think there's some questions about criticisms from spouses and families uh -huh, uh -huh, feeling, uh -huh. feeling um, criticized. Yeah, I think, well, the first thing is back to the one flooded seek higher ground. It's knowing you're you're feeling criticized and just taking a minute to let your your brain settle and also catch up with you to be able to decide how you want to respond in that moment a lot of times we react uh, become defensive passive aggressive um you know or appeasing even in that situation where we just need to let our emotional brain calm down before we make a decision about how to engage um obviously the relationship dynamic is really important to understand there. Uh, and you know, how much does this person understand about ADHD? How open are they, um, to knowing more? Um, you know, is it someone like if it's a spouse, would they be open to couples counseling? Uh, you know, but also I think just directly expressing how that made you feel and what is and isn't okay. I mean, it's a, you know, I feel really criticized when you say that. Um, maybe talking about another way for them to express whatever it is they're trying to express, because oftentimes it's not the exact like words themselves, it's what's underneath it. You know, mm -hmm. oh, you said you do the dishes and you didn't do the dishes. Well, it's, it's probably not about the dishes. You know, it's, well, I feel you said you were gonna do this and you didn't, and that makes me feel, right? So it's a deeper, 
dive, it's a dance between two people. And you have to get to what what's underneath what the other person was saying, what's underneath what your experience of the situation is, and then processing that through. So not okay. just staying on the level of the, the words themselves. Right. All right. Um, so this has been really terrific, Michelle. I can't thank you enough. Um, and I want to uh, repeat the name of um, mm -hmm. Michelle and Sari Solden's forthcoming book, a Radical Guide for Women with ADHD, colon, Embrace Neurodiversity, Live Boldly, and Break Through Barriers, um, available on Amazon now and at Barnes & Noble. I hope you'll all um, check it out. I think you'll find it extremely interesting, innovative, and helpful. And Michelle, thanks again. I hope we'll, yeah. you'll be come back yeah. to Attitude another time. And to our listeners, thanks for being Bet. here today. Um, you'll be able to listen I, to this webinar again if you'd like to or share it with, I know many of you would like to, you'll go to attitude.com slash webinars. You'll see the, the webinar replay library there. So they will be available there later this afternoon. And um, so thanks everybody and have a great 4th of July week. Thank you again, Michelle. Yeah. Bye now. Bye-bye.